And we're back. And I don't wanna waste any time. I wanna get into all the theories I have about episodes three and four, backed up by some general comics knowledge, I guess. One of my theories involves our very own Scarlet Witch. So without further ado, let's talk television. said that we are covering episodes three and four of Loki, but this is your spoiler alert. There will be spoilers in this. So if you haven't watched, don't spoil yourself maybe, or do. You're free to make your own choices. I'm not gonna waste my time going over a ton of the general plot because I assume that if you're here, you've already watched Loki. And so we can just like chat about it, like, like two buds. Is that weird? So we're gonna start with episode three, which is named Lamentus, which is named after the planet that Loki and Sylvie find themselves stuck on when Loki puts them into a random apocalypse on Sylvie's tempad, right? They go to this place and Sylvie says, this is the worst place that you could have taken us. And then they end up trapped there. And this doesn't, isn't relevant, I don't think, but just so you know, Lamentus is said to be like the very edge of Cree space. Cool. Is it? I don't know. And speaking of that, we learn that the variant Loki, right, the other variant Loki, the female variant Loki, calls herself Sylvie, which definitely leads into the idea that she is Enchantress, right? So she's based off a character from the comics called Sylvie Lushton. And in the comics, Loki bestows powers upon a mortal named Sylvie Lushton, just for fun, because he wants to cause some trouble as Loki is wont to do, right? So the MCU has done what it typically does. It'll take some things from the comics, it'll kind of warp it to its will, and then it'll barf it at us and we will consume it and say thank you, right? So they're not saying that Sylvie was a human at some point. She is a variant of Loki. She was born on Asgard, as they discussed in the third episode. And I love to see that discussion because I think Loki is the all-time biggest mama's boy ever. And I love to see him talk about Frigga. And I think that's because Loki is a character who has a lot of edges, right? Particularly 2012 Loki. Like he hasn't gone through that full character arc yet. And so seeing him talk about Frigga makes me feel all warm and fuzzy, chocolate chip feelings inside because that's just some of the softer parts of him and, and he, he really loved his mom, so it's cute. Something else I really loved is we got two for one bisexual Lokis, which is pretty cool. And director Kate Heron herself said it was really important for her to put it in the canon of the MCU that Loki, both Lokis, were bisexual. She herself is a bisexual woman and I really like the way that they went about this. Not that I'm some sort of like, I don't know, bisexual law, howdy partner, cowpoke. I don't, you know, I just think it was done well, honestly. I think that it wasn't made to be a big deal. There was no pause. There was no dramatic, like, whatever. It was, it just was. It just was. And I think that that's nice. Also, there were just some really cute things in this episode. Like, Loki got kind of drunk, and he was singing uh, what the credits said was an Asgardian song. Um, I read somewhere on the internet that he was singing in Norwegian. Impressive. Um, but also he did the thing that Thor did in the first Thor movie where he throws the glass down and he goes, another, when they're in the diner. That was of course a really cute callback. The MCU is great about that kind of stuff. I also really liked how they showed the balance between both Sylvie and Loki, right? Like one saves one, the other saves one. One lands one punch on one and the other lands a punch on the other. You know, it's just, you can tell that they're sort of evenly matched in a lot of ways. And that sort of plays into the idea that there are these sort of foils, they're two sides of the same coin, like whatever you wanna call it. Um, I thought that was really cool. And I loved seeing them both flex their powers, right? We saw Loki be extremely nuked in the first two episodes where he couldn't use any of his powers super boring in my opinion in terms of Loki's character. The episodes weren't boring, but I just like, I love to see him do stuff. And even just like the little fireworks that he did, it was so cute. And he, I mean, he stopped a building from falling over. It just like really showed us how powerful he is. And um, in terms of Sylvie, she learned how to control people's minds in the way that he had to have a, a infinity stone to do. So, you know, I'm sure he'll learn how to do that. Probably that seems like he was trying to ask her questions about it so he could later do it himself, right? But I mean, all in all, it seems like they're trapped on Lamentis because the ten pad breaks, but of course they're not. In episode four, the TVA comes and snatches them. Everything is fine, except now they're in TVA custody and they were like wanted, obviously. 
And so we get right into episode four where we're learning more about Ravana Re Renslayer. Oh my goodness, her name is hard for me to say. Ravana Renslayer. I did it. We learned that Ravana was the original agent who went and grabbed uh, Sylvie out of her timeline um, when Sylvie was just a child um, due to whatever Nexus event happened to be there. And when she was trying to take Sylvie in for her crimes, just like Loki was in the beginning of the series, Sylvie escaped. And she's been on the run from the TVA for her entire life, which is like, pretty sad, right? Like she's just literally trying to live and be a person. And because she's a variant and whatever Nexus event happened on her timeline, like she's not allowed to do that. She's not given a life. She's just gonna be a runaway criminal forever. And that made me like a little bit sad for her. But Ravana plays a kind of a big role in one of my theories. She's one of the reasons why I think this theory holds water and we'll get to that in a little bit. But we do learn that she's pretty cutthroat because she's really good friends with Mobius or so it seems. But she then shortly thereafter uh, orders him to be uh, deleted and he is. Uh, goodbye Owen Wilson. It was great to see you with a respectable adult haircut for four episodes. But Mobius was a good guy so I hope we get to see him again. He really put up with a lot of Loki's bull crap, but also he was kind to him. And that, that was really nice. I think Loki deserves more of that kindness because he's like a little traumatized boy, you know? But the crux of this episode is that Sylvie was slowly showing people the truth about the TVA and Loki tries to tell Mobius and that's what gets Mobius in so much trouble. He starts to question, he steals something from Ravana to learn the truth and the truth is, is that the people inside the TVA that work for the TVA like Mobius and Ravana and the security team, they weren't created by the TVA, they were variants and they were taken from the sacred timeline. So they could have had families and lives before then and Mobius even says before he's deleted, Maybe I had a jet ski. Like, poor guy, I hope you did have a jet ski. I'm so sorry, like, that's upsetting. So Sylvie finds a, an ally in variant B-15, Hunter B-15. And that's lucky because another variant, Hunter C-20, whose memories she brought forth from before she was in the TVA, was deleted because she was too close to finding the truth, right? Unfortunately, um, we then learn that Ravana seems to understand the truth and is working this sort of giant cover-up situation. Weird, bureaucracy, whatever. It seems like Ravana is marching Loki and Sylvie into their death in front of the timekeepers. You have the three timekeepers sitting there and then B-15 comes and turns off their power collars and they're able to fight. She gives Sylvie back her sword, they fight and Basically, they find out that the TVA are fake. The timekeepers are fake. The, they're robots. They decapitate one of them and it's nothing but like wires and stuff, right? And so then Ravana deletes Loki. Yikes, bummer, our 2012 Loki, bye. Um, and Sylvie now has control of Ravana basically. And I think Ravana knows that she is in some deep stuff because she says to Sylvie, do it, delete me. And Sylvie's like, nah, I'm gonna get some answers out of you, right? And we do see in a mid credit scene that Loki seems to be in a familiar position, right? Uh, where he's sort of splayed on the ground and people are looming over him. We've seen that a couple times from him, but it seems like the people looming over him may be Loki variants. So I think in the next episode, we're gonna see Loki with a bunch of other Loki variants. Um, we should have known that it was not gonna be easy for them to kill the trickster god for realsies. All in all, I really like these episodes. I like the mixture of like the fantasy and like the power and magic of WandaVision and then also like the hardcore fight scenes that were in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. It's like this show kind of marries the two together. And that's kind of like my sweet spot to be honest. What I didn't love in these two episodes is like the weird self-flagellating like love between the Lokis. I don't, I don't need anybody in this series to have a love interest. It's not like what I'm here for, right? So I hope that that passes. I hope it was just like a moment and then they were like, we're good because it's weird and I'm not into it. Now, on to these theories that I was talking about. And I think I have two main theories and just put your tinfoil hat on with me and just hold on for the ride. I understand, okay? I understand that this is far left field and weird. And I think one of these theories holds more water than the other. So we'll start with the more absurd theory. And my more absurd theory is that Wanda created the TVA. Now, why do I think that? A couple of reasons. 
You know, at the end of WandaVision, we see her full Scarlet Witch form with the book, and she's got the arms, and she's doing the chaos magic, and she's learning the stuff, right? Surely she's gonna learn what a Nexus event is, right? Because they talked about Nexus stuff in WandaVision. And so as she's going through her time to study, as she's outside of theoretically Wondagore Mountain, which is significant in the comics, because that's where Doctor Doom keeps her after she kind of loses her memory of her children. And it's all a fight for her to get her kids back, basically. Um, the young Avengers go to rescue her and she's like, my children, it's fine. Um, so surely she's gonna learn about Nexuses, Nexi, I don't know. Correct me in the comments, I know you will. Um, so I think, you know, you go into the timekeeper's uh, chambers, that seems correct. And there are what looks like red sigils on the wall. We saw those before when Wanda drew them on the hex walls when she was fighting Agatha at the end of WandaVision. And it sort of went, you know, the witch who draws the sigils on a given area is the only person who can use magic in that area. And if you remember, Sylvie and Loki were not using magic during that fight. That was a pure fist fight inside of that cha of those chambers. And the only weapon that was used was the physical weapon that B-15 had thrown to Sylvie. She even throws that to Loki. He doesn't conjure his own daggers, which he had been doing in the previous episode. So I think that's pretty interesting. And why would Wanda create the TVA? Well, I think Wanda would want to create the TVA to look for Nexus events, to try and find either whatever you want to call it, the reincarnation or the variant of Billy and Tommy. And I think that this makes sense because in the comics, Billy and Tommy are from separate families but still come together and come to understand through Billy's magic that they are twins and then they go with the Young Avengers to go rescue Wanda, right? So I think that this could be playing into this. I know it sounds like a little bit convoluted and I'm like not trying to blame everything on Wanda, right? But I think it makes some sense, a little sense, like five cents. But all of this leads into a theory that, I'm, I mean, I'm not the only one who's had either of these theories, right? But this is a big one, and this one I think holds a lot of water. It's Kang the Conqueror is behind the TVA. And here's why I think that this makes a lot of good sense. If you don't want to be spoiled about stuff, I already warned you once, I'm just being nice now, you know? So here's what points to that. Basically, in the comics, Kang is born on a different Earth, not Earth 616, which is where we're seeing all of this Marvel stuff happen, where is the normal timeline of most of the comics. Um, and you can like look on his wiki if you don't understand that. It's perfectly fine, it's not a huge deal. He has the ability to travel through time, blah, blah, blah. He wants to be the ruler of the universe because of course he does, right? Okay. So that's like, would be reason number one. He would create the TVA. He would want to be in control of it, of everything. He would want to know stuff. He would want to know where really powerful things were if he were trying to take that power. He would want to create a place where infinity stones would be because he would want to take that power. You following? Hmm? Okay. But what also points to this is just the existence of Ravana Renslayer. Because in the comics, Ravana Renslayer is a, an Earth Kingdom princess on this other Earth, not Earth 616, and Kang falls in love with her. And Ravana actually ends up sacrificing herself for Kang um, during a fight with one of the Eternals. Yes, the Eternals of the movie that will be coming out soon. You're seeing, oh, this is all, we're putting a nice little bow on this theory. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna take my tinfoil hat off and um, just say that this is fairly likely. Um, and basically, uh, Ravana is mortally injured and he sort of puts her in this weird stasis um, because he can't cure her, but he can use the technology of the time that he's in to sort of keep her alive and hold her until maybe he can find a way to save her, right? So we've got a villain driven by tragedy now. Okay, so is this Ravana Renslayer his love? Does she know what's going on because he's behind it? Or is she a variant that he put in charge of things because, I don't know, he's in love with her or, I don't know, I think we'll find out. But I don't know that we'll find out in this series. I think the payoff is gonna be far from now. And also the actor who plays Kang, um, he was a star in Lovecraft Country. His name is Jonathan Majors. He's been allegedly seen on the set of Ant-Man and the Wasp Quantumania, which is um, filming right now. So 
Okay. <laughs> and one last thing, this has to do with the Young Avengers and just follow me through this, okay? Everybody take a deep breath. Comics are very convoluted, especially when time travel is involved. Now, Kang the Conqueror has a human name. His name is Nathaniel Richards. And if you're like, oh, that last name sounds familiar in the context of comics, that's because you're thinking of Reed Richards of Fantastic Four. And it is said that he is somehow related to Sue Storm and Reed Richards. He's from a different earth, but somehow they're related. It's fine, just accept it, don't ask questions. So Nathaniel Richards, as a young kid, learns later about his destiny as Kang the Conqueror, and he doesn't want to become Kang the Conqueror. So instead of doing that, he becomes Iron Lad, and he serves as a hero with the Young Avengers. Hello? We're definitely getting a Young Avengers movie or show or something. They're setting it up. We know they're setting it up. I've said this a million times. So this plays really well into what's going on. And we have many different areas for this multiverse situation to happen for young Nathaniel to run into Kang the Conqueror himself and sort of become Iron Lad because of that. I mean, we've got the multiverse of madness and also we've got quantum mania. So I don't know. I just, it makes a lot of sense to me, you know? Iron Lad is the response to Iron Man, of course, in the Young Avengers. Also, comics, because comics, there is some timeline where Kang the Conqueror may be related to Doctor Doom. And that kind of brings it all full circle. Like maybe Doctor Doom and Kang the Conqueror are working with Wanda or manipulating Wanda, if she has anything to do with this at all. I know that that's just like, a reach, but I'm reaching. My arm is tired, I'm reaching. I just, I don't think, the MCU is so intentional about their use of color that I just feel like we were supposed to see that. It was such a stark contrast, we were supposed to see that. So, I don't know, maybe I'm making a mountain out of a molehill, maybe I'm buying, you know, they're like, oh, we'll throw in these things so people like me get confused and just like with the red, you know, string, just like panicking, yeah. I could be just like falling for the fake thing. I don't know. Um, but in the comics, you know, in Children's Crusade, which is the comic where the Young Avengers go to rescue Wanda and Billy and Tommy are reunited with their mother, um, Dr. Doom is there. And this, we're setting this up in a lot of ways. So like, who knows? I don't know. I don't think you know either. But those are my theories. And I have a lot of fun, as you know, sort of doing all these types of things. Um, but I wanna know what you think. Are you enjoying Loki? Do you like Sylvie? Are you interested in her character? Do you find her annoying or boring? Or I think she's hilarious. And I really love that they haven't like sexied her up, you know? I'm just like enjoying her character. But I wanna know what you think. Find me on social media. I'm on Twitter at hello underscore destiny or drop a comment below. Please like and subscribe if you like nerd news content. I am here and I'd love to chat with you. I'm supposed to tell you to like and subscribe. This is YouTube. You know how it goes. I wanna hear from you though. I'd love to chat with you guys. Thank you so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. Um, and I will see you guys next time. Same-ish time, same place. And until then, this has been Nerd News with Destiny.